I'm, I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, the Cherokees, we were, our people were originally from the, the southeast area of the country, and then in what is famously called the Trail of Tears, we were moved to the Oklahoma uh, our homeland, and that's where uh, my tribe is now. But I grew up in California. My father is Cherokee, my mother is actually Portuguese. Uh, and so I grew up in San Francisco, um, and I, you know, I, I had basically two cultures in my household: a, a very uh, you know, native culture, but also a Portuguese, more Latin culture. Um, and so I kind of learned very early to negotiate <laughs> to, to be multicultural in, in some important ways. Um, as far as uh, uh, our traditions, uh, ch the ch Cherokee people were, were very, we're sort of. Uh, We've adopted some time of Western ways, people would call them, and, and, in, and in many ways, we're very much indigenous communities in the sense that we have our lang a language, Chalagi, uh, we uh, organize ourselves politically, socially, uh, in some very traditional ways. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a mix of two, like many, many Indian people across the nation. You know, when I, I think for most people, when you're talking about role models, there are two different kinds. There are sort of role models that you sort of personally know, and then there are role models that uh, you know from sort of being iconic people in the culture. Uh, for me, I, I certainly have family role models. My, uh, my, my grandmother was a role model. My mother was a role model. Uh, and uh, I had aunts and uncles that were, that were role models, and they really taught me uh, right and wrong. They taught me uh, that uh, it's family is important. They taught me about uh, spirituality and the importance of that. Uh, but I also learned a lot from from other role models. I would say, uh, and, and they come from a, a, a vast majority uh, of communities. I think uh, when I learned about Gandhi uh, and and how he transformed the way things worked in a society, fundamentally transformed it, simply by taking a stand uh, and then strategically planning how to meet his goals. Uh, and then you look at somebody like Nelson Mandela who was willing to spend almost three decades in prison to do a similar thing to free his people. And it, and it told me something very important. Th those two individuals told me, uh, among with, uh, along with many, many tribal leaders uh, n n from, from, from today and from, from yesteryear, you know, you must stand up and be counted when you find that there is injustice. And, and, and that has really been a guiding principle for me. Uh, it, it, it made me go to law school. It made me practice the type of law I want to practice. Because uh, there, when you notice injustice and you have the opportunity to change it and you don't, that to me is a fundamental sin. Uh, there are many of the socioeconomic problems that the rest of America faces are particularly acute within Indian country. Uh, let, let's take a number of examples. Health care, for example. Diabetes are at e epidemic proportions. Uh, uh, schools, yeah, dropout rates are extraordinary. Uh, uh, methamphetamine use, just uh, through the roof. Uh, take, take some other issues. Domestic violence, for example. Indian women are more likely to be victims of violent crime than any other racial gender category, period, including African American males. And the interesting thing is this, with Indian women, the vast majority of perpetrators are non-Indians. All the other groups, they're Latino on Latino crime, black on black crime, white on white. For Indians, almost 90% of the perpetrators of the crimes are members of another racial category. So it shows you this, this sort of dramatic outlier statistic when you're talking about violence against Indian women. A plethora of props. Part of it is a gener uh, it, it's an outgrowth of uh, various uh, of poverty issues. You know, you have extraordinary poverty on, the, on some reservations. You know, a lot of times people will see what, uh, uh, they'll see things about casinos and they'll see things about uh, the extraordinary development in certain areas of the country, but that is by and large not the experience of most Indian people on most reservations. By and large, they continue to live in very impoverished situations, particularly in places like South Dakota or the Navajo Reservation in, uh, in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, and, and part of this is the historic relationship with the United States where 
much of the good land was taken, and so the land that they live on is not really something uh, that you can develop anything on. Um, uh, or alternatively, <clears throat> to the extent that they do have resources, there is a, most people don't understand this, but there is a trust system. Indian people, we don't own our land. We do own our land, but based on this legal structure, the United States operates as trustee and manages our lands, whether it's tribal or individual. And they have mismanaged that land for about a century. One congressional report put it as fraud, corruption, and institutional incompetence, almost beyond the possibility of comprehension. And so this trust management system, any, any, any oil and gas developed from Indian land, any timber on Indian land, uh, any, any resource on Indian land is taken and is sold through this trust system that, that literally pays the Indian pennies on the dollar for what a non-Indian would get. And that's this broken trust that we're trying to fix in, in our litigation. As far as um, achie achievements, for me, the most in, uh, important achievement has been bringing and litigating and prevailing on the in the Cobell v. Norton litigation. Uh, it is a, a case in which uh, I, along with a number of other attorneys, represent 500,000 individual Indians uh, whose property has been mismanaged by the United States for a century and continues to be mismanaged today. Uh, an example of the mismanagement, if you're a, a Navajo Alati and you have a right-of-way lease that goes across your land, you will get somewhere around $25 a rod. A rod is a sort of standard measurement for a right-of-way. If you're a non-Indian, you get no less than about $140 a rod, probably more like $500 a rod. So we're talking about literally pennies on the dollar that Indian people are getting for the exact same type of lease. And this is across Indian country. Uh, so our litigation is about uh, saying that the government should provide a historical accounting for all the times that they held our property and all the times that they are supposed to manage properly our funds, uh, and then also to fix the system going forward and to make sure that this is not a broken system going forward, to repair all the problems. And I think that uh, by all accounts, it has prompted uh, the government to take action. Now we're in the thick of it, uh, there's a long road to go, but I think what it has done is it's also demonstrated to Indian people that there are absolutely these critical times in our history when, if you, when you must stand up and be counted and you, must, and you must take proactive actions in order to ensure that your children do not suffer the same indignities and abuse as your grandfathers, grandmothers, mothers and fathers.